So in this leg of my journey, I will be covering the top sites in Cambodia, namely the Angkor temples, the royal palace, a floating village and a lesser known activity that I highly recommend. And of course, we're starting with the Angkor temples because it's the most famous site and let's see if that's true. So there are three options to choose from the official Angkor site. I chose one day because I didn't have much time here. Initially, I didn't know why anybody would get the 7 days pass, but it made sense after realizing the scale of this place. To put it in perspective, Angkor Wat is 8 times the size of Universal Studios Singapore. And what's crazy is that there are 72 temples in this area. Oh my god! One way is to go along with the tours online, but I found those to be restrictive because it's a fixed schedule with limited temples. So I opted for the self-guided version, hiring a tuk-tuk driver for the day. You can easily find a driver on the streets. Just get their numbers and contact them in advance. You could also self-drive, but I wouldn't recommend that if you're unfamiliar with the place. By the way, it was pitch dark because it's a thing to catch the sunrise. I was the first few, so I got a good spot. Unfortunately, the sunrise was pretty meh. Not worth waking up at 3.30am for. Or maybe we were just unlucky. Can't deny this place is special though. It gave off mystical royal energy. At the top, we were rewarded with a view of Buddha. By the way, it's called the Hall of a Thousand Buddhas. It was at this moment that he knew. An English guy would have been helpful because I had no idea what I was looking at. As you can see, the temple doesn't come with signages or descriptions. I don't know why I was expecting it to be developed like the museums where I was spoiled with an audio guide and everything. If the temples had these, that would be amazing to be honest. So for solo travellers, if you want the information and still want freedom and flexibility, you can get a private guide but of course that's gonna be more expensive. Or if you want to save money, just be prepared to do research on the ground and not let your imagination run wild. One down, four more to go. But before that, I'm going to have some breakfast. Because I'm so tired. I haven't seen it personally so I had no expectations. But when I entered it became obvious why it was chosen. Where else can you see literal trees swallowing a temple? And not one tree looks the same. I mean this one just looks like mother nature sitting on a man-made chair. And look at the size of these things. This was really fun to explore too, with maze-like corridors and hidden chambers. And when can you say you forked under a tree? And also, how did the trees grow over the stones? The sea has to be fertilized in the soil. Somehow nature found its way, maybe in the cracks of the structure, and I guess that's the beauty of this place, right? Um, where you can really see nature and history intertwine. I realized most temples had a water body surrounding it. Almost like a water palace. Which is often used as a tool of defense, but why would temples need that? So one narrative is that it helps stabilize the temple's foundation, and the other says it holds symbolic meaning. Started off with a local photographer telling me the best spot for a photo. 
Can you tell what's special about this temple? It's the multitude of smiling stone faces of who exactly is still debated on, totaling a speculative 173 faces today. But the real question is, how long did it take to carve out the faces? This was definitely worth a visit, but because I was on such a time crunch, I sat through two underwhelming temples, so I would say although it's possible to visit five temples in a day, I would recommend three in this order. And if I were to give a one-word description for each, they would be majestic, iconic, and bold. But if you're not into temples, watch ahead because there's actually other stuff to do besides the Angkor temples. Like visit the royal palace, residence of the king of Cambodia. Each colour represents a day of the week worn by palace staff. I know because this time I got a guy at super friendly one too. It's 10 years D for the entrance ticket and another 10 for the guide. And you get a glimpse of the royal life. Initially I thought this was gonna be boring but it actually gave me a lot of insights about Cambodian culture, the history behind it and even present day practices. Full credit to the guide who seemed really passionate about it though. Up next is the floating village on Tom Lee Sap Lake, which is the largest freshwater lake in Southeast Asia. This was quite the unique experience. The guide was saying that even locals might not know about this because it's hidden from plain sight. It was fascinating to see how people adapt to these conditions and make a living off fishing. Although an exclusive community, they are welcoming towards tourists because it helps the economy grow. And finally, the review. This one took me by surprise because aside from the entertaining performance, the effort put into hours of training and creative storytelling, it was heartwarming to know that proceeds go to supporting education for youths at risk and directly providing jobs for artists in Cambodia. And this was after visiting Cambodia's dark history under the Khmer Rouge where intellectuals were systematically killed and education destroyed. So this performance really hit me in a way where I could really feel their fighting spirit towards recovery. I'm not gonna lie, this got me teary-eyed for some reason. So yeah, if there's a must-visit place in Cambodia, it's actually not any of these but the Genocide Museum and the Killing Fields, which I didn't really talk about because it's really heavy and filming wasn't allowed. But trust me, everything else you see in Cambodia will make a lot more sense after this. 